Welcome to Sunstar Gums virtual training on interdental cleaning to prevent and treat gum disease, where we review the state of the evidence and work out what it means for you. You are about to discover Module 1, in which we review the relative efficacy of different mechanical interdental cleaning devices based on randomized controlled studies and systematic reviews of the literature. Module 1 is part of a series of four training modules, based on the evidence from 17 randomized controlled trials and six systematic reviews and meta-analyses. One expert will guide you, Filippo Graziani, professor of periodontology at the University of Pisa and past president of the EFP, the European Federation of Periodontology. Module 1 on the state of the evidence was developed to allow you to get familiar with the evidence base for different mechanical approaches to interdental cleaning. To help you understand the contribution of randomized controlled studies and systematic reviews. To allow you to explore the effectiveness of different interdental cleaning methods in different patient populations while benefiting from top expert commentary. Let's hear the expert. How have oral hygiene studies evolved in the last decade? I think what we're witnessing from an academic standpoint is a shift in oral hygiene studies, but I would say in all periodontology. Uh, we went from a, a sort of a very mechanicistic vision, whereas basically the more plaque you remove, the better, to a vision in which it is important to remove plaque efficac effic efficaciously, but equally important is to change the patient, whether it's a behavior, whether it's a, an approach, whether it's health status and so forth. I think we are now more and more treating a patient and not a mouse. How important are RCTs in our understanding of interdental oral hygiene? Randomized control trials are the foundation of modern science and modern medicine. If we wouldn't have randomized clinical trial, I think we would still say that the best things you can do is to floss in between teeth, which is, you know, of course, if the alternative is not to do anything in between teeth is absolutely true. The issue is that to measure what is best or what works more or in which patient you can do your things, there is no other way unless you run randomized control trial. The only problem is that performing a correct RCTs is actually extremely difficult. What can you tell us about single center studies versus multicentric studies? It is not easy to define a, a well thought uh, oral hygiene studies because I'm more and more thinking that multicenter trials are the trials that should be run, but because they have a huge external validity, of course, you know, their impact, their applicability is huge. The problem is that, of course, multicenter per se carries a tremendous burden in terms of internal validity. They are difficult to run. Uh, they are so complex, really, in terms of organization. But really, what you want to do, when you are trying to evaluate a question that is relevant for a person in their own bathroom, in the morning, when they wake up, and they go in front of the mirror, they have their pyjama, they have the hairs that are spiking up, and they give in the worst beat of their life in that exact moment, you need to have something that is so relevant that can make a change. So to run trials like 12 patients versus 12 patients, to me, there's no interest. That's why I'm really embracing the fact that we need to join forces. And that is not just among researchers. Of course, we need partnership with companies, with stakeholders, but most probably run bigger and more relevant and pertinent questions. How have systematic reviews contributed to our understanding of interdental oral hygiene? We as dentists and oral health professionals are more used to understanding what is evidenced, but uh, uh, it is only thanks to systematic reviews that we discovered lots of bias that we all carried. And I still have my own bias, there's no discussion. But systematic reviews are the most objective way, maybe it's not the most perfect, but surely the most objective way that we have at the moment to evaluate what the others have done. What's your take? Would you agree that toothbrushing alone is good enough for young adults and that motivated patients should floss once a day? Numerous publications have documented that toothbrushing alone simply isn't sufficient for the prevention of gum disease. 
Let's start with some basics. Gum disease is a universal challenge. The prevalence of gingivitis is up to 90%, while periodontitis affects up to 70% of the population. Gum disease can have severe implications for systemic health. It's linked to diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and can negatively affect overall quality of life. Prevention and treatment of gum disease depend on daily mechanical removal of plaque. The accumulation of plaque is associated with redness, bleeding, swelling, pain, and bad breath, while periodontitis sets in when bacteria begin to spread below the gum line. What does the literature tell us? For the effective prevention and treatment of gum disease, toothbrushing alone simply isn't sufficient. Only a portion of plaque is typically removed. But unfortunately, toothbrushing alone is all too common. Interdental cleaning needs to be part of the equation. Findings from RCTs and meta-analyses demonstrate that the addition of interdental cleaning devices to the daily toothbrushing routine is better than toothbrushing alone and reduces interdental plaque, gum inflammation, and bleeding. What about the relative efficacy of different interdental cleaning devices? And what about the changing role of floss? An accumulating body of evidence is displacing floss as the standard of care for interdental cleaning. While compliance with oral hygiene instruction is of critical importance, patients changing habits and behaviors are known to be among the most complex issues in the field. Which is why the EFP and the European Organization for Caries Research have clearly acknowledged that ease of use drives compliance. The ability of patients to effectively and easily clean their own teeth promotes compliance. High quality flossing is effective but difficult to achieve in real life. It requires both dexterity and motivation. Indeed, systematic reviews and randomized controlled studies point in the very same direction. Incorrect flossing technique is common and reduces efficacy. In real life, patient compliance is low. A landmark 2008 systematic review by Sloten colleagues even found that ineffective use of floss does not provide additional benefit over toothbrushing alone. Less demanding and easier to use methods of interdental cleaning are necessary. So what makes interdental cleaning more acceptable to patients? Interdental brushes are better suited to filling interdental spaces and are regarded as easier to use. Patients are therefore more willing to use them regularly. Rubber interdental cleaners similarly fill interdental spaces and remove plaque while stimulating gingival blood flow. Moreover, a recent study undertaken at ACTA in Amsterdam by Hennequin and Sloat reported that patients found rubber interdental cleaners even easier to use than interdental brushes, and that they caused fewer gum abrasions. In summary, easier to use interdental brushes and rubber interdental cleaners are associated with increased motivation and compliance and greater efficacy in removing interdental plaque compared with floss. The implications for dental practice? Recommend interdental cleaning to all your patients. Train them on how to use interdental brushes and rubber interdental cleaners with a focus on ease of use. And relegate floss to the tightest interdental spaces. Join us for Module 2 to learn all about the role of interdental cleaning devices in the prevention of gum disease in periodontally healthy subjects. If you found this interesting and would like to take a deeper dive into the literature, head to the Sunstar Gum website to download the white paper and a full set of slides.